Good morning. It is good to have you here this morning. We're always thankful for your presence. We are in the midst of a study through the book of Ephesians, and we've gotten there from the book of Exodus, where we have been talking about God's people. And if you've been with us on this journey, we are thankful for that. And if you have your Bibles this morning, we're in Ephesians chapter 3. If you've ever wondered what the Bible is about, it's in this chapter. The Apostle Paul is going to explain to us what God was doing in the world. We'll try to note three points this morning in these first several verses of chapter 3. Paul is going to use the word mystery as he describes God's work, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. There is something in Scripture called providence. It's not a word that's used very often. In fact, the one time it is used, I don't think it's used of God, but of a man. But really, it's describing how God accomplishes his will and accomplishes his desires through human history. Someone has referred to it as providence, that is, providence, the way God provides. And that's probably not a bad way to think of it. It's not something that requires a miracle, and that's what's interesting about it. Where God does miracles sometimes in the Bible, they're not the norm, they're the exception. Providence is the norm. And providence involves humans. It involves the choices of men. Sometimes men make good choices, and God uses that. Sometimes men make bad choices, and God uses that to accomplish his will. It doesn't even require a good or righteous man. God can and has used evil men and righteous men. I think of Exodus 9 and 16 and Romans 9 and 16, 17, which both speak of Pharaoh being used by God to accomplish God's will. What we're talking about this morning is the mystery of God. And as the Apostle Paul is going to explain, that mystery has been revealed when we're reading the Bible, that's what we're reading. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the seed of Genesis 12 and Genesis 28, the land, the nation, and ultimately the Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 16. Sometimes you can read about it and you hear it. Think statements like the one Joseph made in Genesis 50 and verse number 20, where Joseph says of his brethren, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Well, what's Joseph talking about? Their hatred of him and their choice to sell him. He said, you meant that to be evil, but God used that to be good. And God has done that to bring a pass and save much life as it is this day. When you and I are reading through the Bible and we reach the cross of Christ, that is a culminating event, but it's not the end of the mystery. And sometimes as people read from Genesis forward, they get to the cross of Christ and they think, well, that's it. That is the zenith and the pinnacle and all that God was doing. And while certainly it is overwhelmingly the major emphasis of Scripture, it's not the end of the mystery. And for many people, I think that's why they have a hard time understanding the Bible beyond the cross of Christ. Jesus says in John 19, 30, it is finished. When he says that, he's referencing his portion of work in the mystery. He's not saying the mystery is finished. He's saying his work in the mystery is finished. The apostle Paul is going to talk about that mystery, and while he is writing and preaching, it's ongoing. Paul is one of the people used in carrying out and completing the mystery of God. Began reading with me here in Ephesians chapter 3. We'll start in verse number 1. Paul says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. He introduces it back in chapter 1 and verse number 9, but you will notice Paul's connection to the mystery. Well, that wasn't always the case. At one point, he was Saul of Tarsus. And when he was Saul of Tarsus, he was not seeking to do God's will. 
He would say of himself in Acts 26 and verse number 9, I thought within myself that I should do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which things I did. We read about him in Acts chapter 8, holding the coats of those who killed Stephen. And then as we get into Acts chapter 9, we read him having authority from the chief priests and elders to go persecute Christians. It's on that occasion that he meets Jesus, and he is then made a part of God's purposes and plannings, and that's what he says here. Three times his conversion is recorded for us in the book of Acts, and each time we read it, we learn a little bit more about what he says here in Ephesians. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9, and let's note some things about Paul's conversion. Paul says of himself, he was before injurious and a persecutor, and uh, uh, 1 Timothy 1, 13 to 16 here, while on the way to meet and persecute Christians, and down in Acts 9 and verse 13, the Bible says, But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said, Ananias needs some convincing, and so verse 6, 15, the Lord said to him, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine. Who chose him? Jesus says, I did. To do what? To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For well, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name. Turn over to chapter 22 and listen to him again now as he stands before uh, kings, as he was told, and rulers, and give a, an account, he says now, with regards to his conversion. Back in Acts 22 and verse number 12, he says, a certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked at him. He said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. Verse 15 says, for you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Go over to chapter 26. You could continue to read 22, and you'll read Paul continuing to give that defense, and he'll mention the word Gentiles down in the verse 22, and when he says that, well, they want to kill him for even suggesting it. In Acts chapter 26, in verse number 14, he says, when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Lord, who are you? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But get up, stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to those in which I will appear to you. Notice what he says in verse 17, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Now, as the Apostle Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians in chapter 3, he says, I was made by whom? By Jesus. I was made a minister of this mystery. I was made a minister for you, for the Gentiles. Paul then has been made such by Jesus Christ. The mystery then was revealed to Paul so that he could preach it and write it and teach it. And he says in verse number four, by referring to this, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. If you've ever wondered what the Bible is about, Paul says, 
it was given to me, and I wrote it down. And when you read it, you can understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He says, in other ages it was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. Let's consider, consider a few questions. If one were to ask, how can I know what the Bible is about? How can I know the mystery? The answer given in verse number four is, whereby when you read, you can understand. The Bible is intended to be understood. God had it written for a reason. And Paul says, when you read it, you can understand. Someone else might ask, well, is God's work a mystery today? No, it's not a mystery, not anymore. Listen to what Paul says there in verse number five. He says, in other generations, in ages past, it was not made known. But now it's revealed to his apostles and prophets. Sometimes you hear people say, well, God does things in secret, and the secret things belong to God. Deuteronomy 29, 29 does say that. The secret things belong to God. But then the rest of that verse says, but to those things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. These things now, what Paul is saying is, what was once a secret has now been revealed. When God reveals it, it's no longer a secret. Now we know. Well then, what is it? What's the mystery? That's verse number six. Verse number six just explains the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, partakers, uh, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. Well, let's just break down the verse. That the Gentiles, who are the Gentiles? The non-Jewish people. You have one group of people that belong to God. The Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob descendants. Those people are God's people. Exodus 19, 4 through 6, you are my chosen people above all nations. Well, who are the Gentiles? Everyone else. Everyone not a Jew is a Gentile. What's the mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. With whom? With the Jews. Partakers, joint sharers of the promises, God's announcements by the gospel. This was not always the case. And in fact, as you're reading the Old Testament, nothing in the Old Testament would lead you to this conclusion. Now, there will be allusions and things you could know from other passages, but the mystery is that the Jews would have believed themselves to be God's people exclusively, and they were for 1,500 years. But there was, in the mind of God, the Gentiles. It wasn't always this way, though. Look at verse number 11 of chapter 2. You remember what Paul says to the Gentiles, and one of the reasons they needed to appreciate their present state was because their past is described in those words. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles, in the flesh you are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh made by hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from the covenants of the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise and having no hope and without God in the world. That was the state of the Gentiles. When you and I are reading the Bible then, what the Bible is saying is God's mystery was that all along he had in mind the Gentiles also being included and accepted in Christ. The mystery is not mysterious. The mystery is not mystical. You're not supposed to be trying to figure it out. The mystery has been revealed. The mystery is understood. The mystery is explained. We now know what God was doing in the world. The Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs 
fellow members of the same body. Well, what's the body? What's he talking about? Go back to chapter 1 in this book and look at how the chapter ends. Speaking of Jesus, in verse number 21, he says of Christ, he is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named only in the, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he hath put all things under his feet and given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Well, verse number 6 of chapter 3 says that the Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs. They're going to be God's children, inheritors of God's riches and his blessings, fellow members of the body. There's going to be a body here, a group of people that belong to God. That's the mystery, that God was working on a plan all the way through human history that culminates in one one body of people belonging to him. One body of people from where? From all nations, every ethnicity, every background, every conceivable climb and form that those who come to Jesus will be reconciled to God in one body. Paul says that's the mystery. That's what God was doing. Paul says he was made a minister of that mystery. One of the qualifications for a deacon over there in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is that he must hold the, the mystery in a good conscience. He must hold the faith of the mystery in a good conscience. Paul says in verse number 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. That's that appearance to Jesus, the recorded three times. He made me a minister for you Gentiles to preach to you the gospel. He says in verse number eight, to me, the very least of all saints is this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable, the unfathomable riches of Christ. You're not to live your life trying to figure out God's mystery. Sometimes people say, well, you go out and you figure out what the Lord wants you. He, he got a purpose for you. He's got something for you. It's a mystery right now. You don't know what it, no, nope, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to read and understand God's mystery. You're not to think or to go around saying the Lord works in mysterious, mysterious ways, his wonders to— No. He's revealed his mystery, and now it's known. In fact, you have in your hand or on your tablet or phone or computer, you have digitally or in print the sum total of God's revelation to man. There is nothing lacking or missing. You have it all, and it's all been revealed. John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 12 and verse 48, he that rejected me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. Words are spoken, the same judgment in the last day. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures inspired of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. It wasn't made known in the past, but it's now been revealed. There's no more revelation from God coming. The apostles and prophets wrote it down. In fact, this is the primary work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the mind of God. And so there's revelation and inspiration and confirmation. The Holy Spirit reveals the mind of God to the apostles and prophets. No man could have known it. The Holy Spirit revealed it. 1 Corinthians 2, 8 to 13, it's now been revealed to us by his Spirit. Well, that's revelation. He made known what you could not have known. And then there's inspiration. That's Matthew 10, 16 to 20. They're going to arrest you, and when they do, they're going to bring you before the councils. Take no thought what you shall say, because it won't be you speaking. It'll be the Spirit of my Father speaking through you. That's inspiration. And then there's confirmation. The gifts that the apostles did confirmed the messages they preached. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And when they penned it and wrote it, they were very adamant, don't add to it, don't take away from it. 
Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Here is an individual saying, what I am preaching, what I am saying, the Holy Spirit gave it to me. Notice what happens when the Holy Spirit reveals God's mind. It's preached and it's wrote. And they intend for you to follow that and nothing else. Colossians 4 and verse number 16, Paul says, And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. 1 Thessalonians 5, 27, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 2, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, so then brothers stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us either by our spoken word or by our letter. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. 2 Thessalonians 3, 17, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. 2 Peter 3, 1, this second letter that I write to you, beloved, and both them I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. 2 Peter 3, 15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. When you're reading the Bible, it has a beginning, and at some point, the mystery is finished. Revelation 10, 7 says as much. But in the day of the trumpet called to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God is finished, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. In fact, it's prophesied that at some point, prophecy will end and prophets will end. Second, Zechariah 13 and verse number 1 down to verse number 9, several things will happen. It will happen when the fountain of uncleanliness will be opened. That is, when the remission of sin is available. When Jesus comes, when he dies for the sins of the world, the fountain of uncleanliness will be opened. The prophet and the unclean spirit will be put out of the land. Anyone claiming to be a prophet will be found a liar. The shepherd will will be smitten, smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. The city will be destroyed, and the faithful will be refined. There is no more revelation from God. The mystery is finished, whereby when you read, you can understand my knowledge in the mystery. What is the mystery? Verse number six, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body. There is only one place where God reconciles all men to himself through Jesus Christ. Brings us to point number two, and that is the fellowship of the mystery. That's what Paul says and how he describes it. Notice in verse number nine, he says, after he says he preaches the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, he then says, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, the fellowship of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Paul says in verse number 9, for all men to know the fellowship of the mystery. Well, who are the all men? In Scripture, it's much the same. It's the Jew and the Gentile that he's been talking about. Why are they the all men? Well, that's all there is. Either one is a Jew, a descendant of Abraham, or he's a Gentile. That constitutes all men. Why do all men need to see the fellowship of this mystery? Well, if you go back to chapter 2, here's what we studied. In verses 1 through 3, all men were under sin. 
in verses 4 through 7, all men were in need of God's love and mercy and grace. All men are saved the exact same way, verses 8 through 10, by grace through faith. All men have been brought near by Christ, chapter 2 and verse number 13. But now in Christ, you who were far off have been brought near. All men are now made at peace with God through Jesus Christ, chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. He is our peace. And because of that, all men need to see the fellowship of the mystery, which God has appointed in Christ Jesus. But he goes further than that. The next thing he says is that the church is the manifold wisdom of God. Verse number 10 and 11, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church, through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've been with us near or from the beginning of this study, you know that we actually started back in Exodus chapter 3. Way back in Exodus chapter 3, we said we're going to start a series of sermons about the church in the New Testament. Well, why would you be starting in Exodus chapter 3? Because in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is at a bush that's burning and not consumed. And the voice that comes out of the bush says to him, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Well, when we read that, we wanted to know what's the significance of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we went back to chapter 2 of Exodus. And in chapter 2, near the end of that chapter, the Bible says that those individuals who had persecuted God's people had died, a new king had arisen, and, and, and God remembered his people. And he remembered the promises he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And that's why he was appearing to Moses. Well, when we read chapter 2 and we said, well, wait a minute, there are promises made. Where are the promises? That's how we got back to Genesis 12. Because in Genesis 12, we read the promises, the land, the nation, and the seed. Well, if we got to chapter 12, we asked then, why do we need these promises? That's how we got back to Genesis 3. And when we were in Genesis 3, we were introduced to sin. And sin and death came into the world. And as a result of sin and death entered into the world, man has a problem he can't solve. Well, when we were in Genesis chapter 3 with sin and death in the world, we looked back at Genesis 1 and 2 where there was no sin. The Apostle Paul has taken us back before Genesis 3, a time when there was no sin. But more than that, the Apostle Paul has taken us back to a time when there was no time. You see, the Bible begins in the beginning. And so God makes space and time. God does that. But what was there before space and time? Well, it's just God. And what the Apostle Paul is telling us is there was in the mind of God a plan before there was a man, before there was the beginning. When you and I think about the mystery and we think about the church, note again what verse 10 and 11 says. Verse number 10 says, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known how? By the church. The church is the manifold wisdom of God. The church makes known the manifold wisdom of God. Okay, but more than that. He then says that's going to be made known to the rulers and to the authorities and the principalities and heavenly places. Yeah, but more than that. He says this was in accordance with the eternal purpose of God. That means before time. That means in eternity God had us in his mind. That means before sin, God already had a plan to redeem. That means the church is not an afterthought. God didn't come up with a plan after sin entered into the world. God didn't have to scramble to figure out what he was going to do to get us back. There's never been a time when we've not been on his mind. There's never been a time when he didn't have a plan. This is also the reason, friends, when people say, go to the church of your choice, they don't understand the Bible. There is no choice other than the one God made. Why? It was purpose in eternity. What was purpose in eternity? Read the verse again. The church, the manifold wisdom of God, purpose in eternity. This plan of one body of reconciling all mankind in one place through Jesus Christ back to the Father, that is purpose in eternity. 
When you start reading your Bible, what you're reading is God telling you how he did it. He's telling you, here's how I made it. That's chapter 1 and chapter 2. He then tells you, and then sin entered into the world. And then he tells you as early as Genesis 3.15, and I went back to work to carry out my plan. That's how we get to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and Joshua, and David, and the prophets, and ultimately to Jesus. How do we get there? The plan was purpose in eternity, whereby when you read, you can understand when Jesus comes on the earth, he's not trying to figure out why he's here. He's not responding and guessing. He came to build his church. He came to build his people. They ask him, Jesus says, who do men say that I am the son of man? I say, I'm say you're John the Baptist, son of Jeremiah, others, one, Elijah, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? Well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon, by Jonah, flesh and blood, and I reveal this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Friends, that's not a denomination. That's not one of many. That's the one that's been purposed. That's the one that's been prophesied. That's the one that's been planned, purposed, prepared, prophesied, and Jesus is here to purchase. That's that one. It's not more than that. Friends, that's all the Bible is about. The coming of the kingdom in the Old Testament is the spiritual Israel in the New Testament, translated out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1.13. He purchased it with his blood, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. When you're reading the Bible, you're understanding God's unfolding plan, which he purposed in eternity. Heavenly powers and principalities also now know it. Verse 9, to make all men see. Verse 10, principalities and powers in heavenly places may also see. They didn't know either. Angels are ministers of God sent on behalf of those who shall obtain salvation, Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. They came to earth on our behalf to further the plan, but they didn't know the plan either. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 10, concerning our salvation, this mystery, the salvation, Peter says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that we have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels desire to look into. Well, now it's complete. Now all men can see it. Now the principalities and powers in heavenly places can see it. The church is the manifold wisdom of God. You can imagine peering over from heaven, asking God, what you working on? What you doing? What, what, why is that happening? Why is that happening? Why? And when we get here, Paul says, it's as if heaven would hold up the church and say that is the manifold wisdom of God. That's the purpose planned from eternity. What does it do? We close in verses 12 and verse 13, where the third thing that Paul says is these blessings that are part of this mystery. The blessings are in verse 12. Verse number 12, the Bible says, speaking of Christ, in whom we have boldness, confidence, and access through faith in him. Three things, Paul says, as a result of what God has done in the world. Number one, we have boldness. The word boldness means freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech, openly, frankly, without concealment. Well, who is speaking with boldness? The ones who have been made the mystery, the ones who now know the mystery. Well, who would that be? That'd be the apostles and prophets of verse number three. What are they speaking so boldly? The mystery. Verse number six, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. 
You read the book of Acts and you listen to their preaching and their teaching, and it's bold, it's frank, it's open, it's without concealment. As early as Acts chapter 2, they preach it. You killed him, God raised him, and we are witnesses of it. They preach it again in Acts chapter 3. We know your fathers were ignorant, you know you're ignorant, but you killed him, and God raised him, and we're witnesses. And they keep preaching. In Acts chapter 4, they're arrested, and they're asked, by what name? By what authority are you doing these things? Be it known unto you. If we are questioned as to why the man stands who is impotent is made whole, be it known. It's by Jesus of Nazareth, verse number 12 of chapter 4. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. They're preaching the resurrection to people who don't believe in the resurrection. And when those people hear their boldness, verse number 13 says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived them to be ignorant, unland men, unlearned men. They took note of them. They had been with Jesus. This preaching that they're doing, unreserved, bold, without concealment, the Gentiles have access, have a right to God through Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 15, they would stand and defend it against the Jews and false brethren. What else do we have? He says, we have access. That word means to approach admission into one's presence. What does the preaching of Christ provide? Access to God. It provides reconciliation, justification, salvation. Back in chapter 2 and verse 13, he said, you were far off, but now you've been brought near. You've been brought into his presence, access. You're no longer a stranger. That's chapter 2 and verse number 18 and 19. Through him, we both have access to God by one spirit. So then you're no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens. What are you now? Well, now you're a fellow citizen, a member of the same body. It's exactly what Jesus said in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. How does one gain access to God? It's through the gospel. Go back and look at verse number six again. He says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. There's no other way to have access to God except the gospel. There's not another way. In fact, you could have a personal appearance from Jesus and not have access. Saul of Tarsus did. Jesus appeared to Saul in Acts chapter 9. On his way to persecute Christians, he met Jesus. And all in Jesus' earthly ministry, he would say, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. That they would know the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. And so he did that. But not now. After the cross of Christ, not even Christ himself can forgive your sins, not even if you meet him personally. When Saul said to Jesus, what would you have me do? Jesus said to him, go into the city, and it'll be told you what you must do. Amen. You know, we read a few verses later, and we hear Jesus talking to Ananias. Go to Saul. What does Saul need? Well, he had a personal encounter with Jesus, but he couldn't be saved by that because Jesus told Ananias, you go to him. And what did Ananias do when he arrived? Brother Saul, receive your sight. Why are you tarrying? This is Acts 22, 16. Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The mystery is still being unfolded as you read the book of Acts. It's not complete. The Lord's work is complete, but the mystery is not complete. And by the time you're reading the book of Acts, the gospel is God's power unto salvation. Can't be saved any other way. And so even though you're reading miraculous events, you're reading the Holy Spirit, Spirit, angels, and here even Jesus, none of them ever saved anybody. In fact, they continue to be involved. In Acts chapter 8, the eunuch, uh, Philip, is told by a spirit and by, by the spirit and by an angel. But what's he told to do? Go join yourself to that chariot. What does that man need? Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't help that man. The angels doesn't help that man. What that man needs is Philip. And so Philip goes to him, and as he's reading Isaiah 53, Philip teaches him the scriptures, and then the man says, see, here's water. What's hindering? 
and me to be baptized. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius is praying, won't be saved by prayer. Cornelius is told, your prayers are come up before God as a memorial. In fact, an angel appears to Cornelius. Can't save him. Instead, what the angel does, the spirit also involved, they tell him, send men to Joppa. Why does he need to send men to Joppa? Because there's somebody in the house named Simon. There's two Simons in the house. Get the right Simon. There's somebody in the house named Simon, and when he comes, he read Acts 10 and Acts chapter 11, and Acts chapter 11 puts stuff to 10 in order. Listen to what Cornelius says when Peter arrives at his house. He says, we are all here present to hear what you have, what God has commanded for us. And in Acts chapter 11, he's told, when they come, he will tell you words whereby you and your house must be saved. You can have access to God, absolutely, but what provides that access? The gospel. This is why you are not free to decide how to be saved. This is why there are not five, three, ten, a hundred different options on salvation. One person says, well, I just let the Lord come into my heart. Another person says, I just pray through. Still another says, I had a personal experience. Another says, well, I just tarried for the Holy Spirit. None of these ways is the gospel. How do you have access? Verse number six, through the gospel. God's power to save, Romans 1, 16 and 17, and even when there were miracles being done, angels appearing, Christ appearing, the Holy Spirit directly talking, nobody was saved after the cross of Christ, his ascension, seated at the right hand of God, reigning over his kingdom. No one has ever been saved or can be saved any other way than the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those that have, what does that provide? Well, Paul says boldness, access, and what's the third thing? Confidence. Confidence, he says. Trust, reliance. Where? In God. What's this all been about? Chapter 2 and verse number 4, but God being rich in mercy. Go back and read chapter 1 where God plans and purposes and prepares, where God calls and predestinates and chooses Read chapter 2, where God's great love and his grace and his mercy. What is this about? It's about God. What's the confidence in? God. It's always been in God. In God's plan, in Christ, chapter 3 and verse number 11. In Christ's shed blood, chapter 2 and verse number 13. In his promises, in his gospel, in his power. And what does it end? Verse number 13 concludes, wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. The faithful life of a Christian is a life of knowledge and certainty. We know what God was doing in the world because God has revealed it. And that revelation has been made known. In fact, the mystery is finished. You say things like that and people say, so what you saying? So what you're saying is God's not working in the world. That's not what I said. That's not what I said at all. You know, I began talking about providence. Does God still work in the world? Yes. Is God's providence still active in the world? Yes. Does God still do things uh, according to his purpose and his wills? Yes. Do you know what they are? Can you tell me with any degree of accuracy what God is doing right now? What's on his mind? I'm not telling you God does not work in the world. He answers his children's prayers. He continues to carry out his will. What I'm telling you is what people do is they still have God working out his mystery. They take what he has revealed and they put it down. And then they say, he told me last week. If he told you last week, that's revelation. If he told you last week, that's not in here. You see, this can't be all you need if he's still telling people things directly. And that's what happens. The Bible becomes an afterthought. The Bible becomes secondary. 
the Bible becomes a resource of sorts, but really it's more for just kind of finding good thoughts and favorite passages. But when I go to live my life and direct it, I put that down. And I wait. You know, what was not once known has now been revealed. And you have it all. Don't take what God has revealed and put it down. And then live your life based on your guesses and your hunches and your feelings, which amount to just that. Because they can't be confirmed. They can't be proven. They can't be substantiated. The only thing that people say to me very often is, Eric, you don't know, and you're right. I don't know. You don't know what the Lord said to me. You're right. I don't know. But I can tell you, God is not saying anything beyond this today. I can tell you that. And that's exactly what Paul is trying to tell us. There was a time we didn't know, and now we do. And I would add this quick thought, and we'll end. Would you spend some time this afternoon thinking about what it took God to get from eternity to the revelation of John? Would you spend some time thinking about how many thousands of years he worked on that? How many people he was involved with on that? How much time in their lives he spent on that? How many prayers? How much evil? How many kingdoms? How many different things God did to get to that? And if you will spend a decent amount of time on that, then you'll sit amazed and thankful that what he has done is giving you a message that allows you to be a part of that. Amen. And you might just go buy your own car. And you might just pick your own clothes out. And you might stop asking God to make your everyday decisions which he's allowed you to do. He has worked on your eternal salvation. You'll probably have to tie your own shoe. You're not a Christian this morning, become one. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Change your heart and change your mind and repent. Humble yourself. Give your life to him. He has given so much to you. He's given his son, his shed blood, to die for your sins. Would you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Would you repent? Would you confess the name of Jesus and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? And would you let God through Jesus save you? There's no other way to God through Jesus, and there's no way to obey Jesus except the gospel. If you've never done that, we invite. If we can help in any way, if you have questions, we'll be glad to try to help. Anything we can do to assist, please let us know as we stand and as we sing.